We're ready. Okay. Let us begin. Que la fête commence. Cameron Roberts. Okay, here he is. Here he is. <laughs> that was my long introduction. Uh, thank you for that fine introduction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's that good? <laughs> um, yeah, it's nice to be here in the barn tonight. You know, in Patsy's salon. I was thinking uh, of all the times I've come up here, you know, what a you know, warm and intelligent crowd it is here. Uh, I suppose one's hard pressed to find uh, as sophisticated a crowd as the summer community in Sandwich, so I have to tell you I'm a little bit intimidated here. Um, <laughs> this is not the summer crowd. This is <laughs> Pardon me. It's not? Oh, Patsy, you didn't tell me. Um, um, Oftentimes, when I'm talking to young painters, they say to me, uh, gee, I really, I really need to learn perspective, you know, to become a better painter. And uh, what I always say to them is, I hope, I hope you never do. <laughs> and I show them, uh, I show them this painting, right? Van Gogh's bedroom. Uh, and uh, yes, it's, it's, it's kind of in perspective, but it's also, it's a little messed up, right? Your, your view is sort of, you know, from the ceiling, and you can see, uh, you know, things seem to be existing in slightly different perspective as you look around the room, the chair, the table. Uh, but it's, it doesn't matter. You're in that room, you know. It's a completely charming and intimate painting. Uh, so, one of the things I want to talk about today, and, and, and by the way, I, I disclaim, I am not an art historian, I'm just a painter. And so, I'm, I'm going to give you, the, what I'd like to do is invite you to look at some painters, uh, so, some paintings with me, as a painter would. And uh, if what I have to say doesn't seem quite true, well, you know, there's the Italian expression, you know, if it's not true, it should be. So, hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, you know, perspective, as you know, sort of developed in the 15th century. There are lots of theories about how and where it develops. You know, there's Brunelleschi's mirror. Uh, there's, you know, Leonardo's, uh, you know, camera obscura. One, one of the things I find the most interesting is that, and, and sort of not talked about much, is the surveyors have a lot to do with the, with the development of perspective because, of course, they're actually trying to create a perspective in reverse to create uh, cartography if for no other reason than to judge you know, artillery distances uh, for battlements. And so there's a lot of work going into the sort of geometry of vision uh, that leads to the sort of early development of painting and uh, of perspective in a number of different places. But just to remind you of sort of the basic elements of a perspective, there's the concept of a vanishing point. And a vanishing point is where all of the optical rays from where you're sitting vanish to a horizon line. And, and conveniently, in this construction, you'll notice the horizon line is at your eye level. So in a, in a kind of a strict one-point perspective, taken at eye level, this is what it looks like. And from that, you can also begin to delineate the gradients uh, on the ground, which is one of the clues as those gradients become tighter and tighter as they move back to the horizon line, that this has been constructed uh, correctly, correctly mathematically. Um, another uh, aspect of this that is important, excuse me, is, is the idea that uh, those optical rays are coming through a picture plane to a, a, to a focal point, a single point. This is much like the idea of the camera obscura, uh, obscura for, for this uh, image on the picture plane to be correct and for it to, to, to intersect these optical lines, 
and I'm not sure exactly what Durer is drawing in this case, but here he is. Uh, he is holding his a point of vision at a fixed spot. If he were to move, it would move his vanishing point, it would move the horizon line. So, in order for this picture plane to accurately intercept <coughs> those optical lines, the point of vision has to be fixed. It's a very mathematical uh, construction. Um, the other thing that I want to just bring up here because it has an awful lot to do uh, with what I'm going to show you later on is that uh, the business of the horizon line if the in, a, in, in the perspective I showed you before the horizon line was at eye level or street level so if you were looking at this cube you know you're looking at the face of the cube you can't see the top you can't see the bottom you just see the leading edge of it but if it were a bird's eye view, you would be up above looking down on it. So in that case, if you think of where Durer is, he's up at a bird's eye level looking down. If, by contrast, you are very low, you're looking at a worm's eye view, you can't see the top, you might see the bottom if it was floating. So the point is, just as Durer's eye level is fixed, the construction of that painting tells you where you are. And that's the way perspective works. So it's important to realize, well, you know, what, what was happening before, right? So let's say we look at an early, uh, early 15th century painting like by Giotto, okay? You can see that the construction of the space is really not entirely uh, described, right? In other words, this is a nativity scene, and yes, you know, the manger here has a little bit of construction to it. But as for the space in which everybody else is appearing, right, it's, 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 it's sort of a metaphysical space. It's not a perspectival space uh, like we were looking at in that first illustration. Uh, so, you know, and there's a lot of discussion about, well, how did you understand what was important in the painting then, and, but th that's a topic for another day. So, by the time you get to, um, you know, the end of the 15th century, beginning of the 16th century, you start to have properly constructed perspective in painting, and this is a you know, perfect example by Perugino, The Marriage of the Virgin, dated right at the end of the, end of the 15th century. And, and in it, what you see is you see a, you know, a proper perspective. And how do you know it's a perspective that's properly created? Sorry that I'm not doing this very well here. You can see a horizon line here going right through the chapel. And you can also see these gradients that, you know, that the ground pattern we saw in that diagram I was showing you before. And so if you follow the lines of the pavement, they all vanish to the horizon line at the vanishing point, right? You can even come up here and look at the angle of the cornices or the gutters on the little chapels to the side, and they are also constructed, drafted, so that they, their lines va vanish to that vanishing point. All very, you know, correct, right? There's another thing that, there's another, Import, well, I'll talk, we'll talk about that later. So, uh, now, if you look at the foreground here, uh, there's a certain flatness uh, to this. It's almost as if you're in the orchestra section of a theater looking through this proscenium. And, you know, the stage actors are all at the front of the stage. This could almost be a stage flat behind so that you know even though that's very correct um, the the uh, relationship between oh sorry point of this was to illustrate those gradients it's a little hard to see from where you are but you know trust me they they decrease as they go back towards the vanishing point but when you look at the figures in the foreground there's a kind of flatness 
to them. And you'll notice that the gradients don't come through the ground plane here. Uh, Perugino hasn't quite figured out how to unify uh, the painting. So if you go back now and look at the overall painting, you can see that sort of uh, stage set kind of quality to it. Now the painting this is always compared to is the one that has really the identical date by Raphael, uh, his marriage of the Virgin. All right, you've all seen these two paintings, and you know, they're probably the most discussed two paintings from the Renaissance, right? Now here again, perfect perspective. Uh, it's, it's a more robust painting, right? I mean, amongst other things, okay, there's certain things that he, he's done, like the chapel is turned into a tempietto here so that the landscape moves around it. Uh, the effect of uh, sfumato, that Italian term for fog, whereby things that are in the distance are grayed out is, is very dramatic here. And in addition, the pavement and the gradients are very thorough there. So you really aren't going to read that like a stage flat. You can feel that space. You can measure that space behind these figures. And then, of course, there are the figures themselves and how they operate now in this very robust perspectival space. And one of the things that Raphael is doing, because, by the way, if you construct a, a perspective like this, the figures in the foreground get so distorted, get so long, that you have to adjust them. And what Raphael has done is effectively foreshortened them and tilted them up slightly at you to create a second vanishing point right at the ring. So now if you look back, okay, which, by the way, puts you in two different places. You know, you have an eye level view and a bird's eye view simultaneously. And you I find, you know, when I look at this, that I'm in that painting when I'm looking, or I'm, I'm very present when I look at that painting, right? I'm not standing apart from it in an objective way. You really, it's a better painting, right? Um, so, so that. Now, okay, Raphael, art historians will call him a mannerist, and okay, so they're, you know, they have, they have thorough command of perspective at this point, so you now find, rather than single point perspectives, you have multiple vanishing points here, you know, right in Christ's navel is a kind of vanishing point down here, Oh, well, there's another one out there in the landscape beyond, or, you know, here, um, you hardly have kind of two paintings, one in which there's a vanishing point down here, and conveniently, this rock outcropping sort of separates these two, so you can have another vanishing point up here. Uh, these become very complex paintings, you know, and they're, they're very uh, robust. Here, you know, you have a vanishing point down in here with the sea creatures, and you have another one, right? actually outside the painting. They're very robust paintings. And so, you're, you know, one of the things I find that happens in these later mannerist paintings is that you're, you're no longer sitting in this static space. I think you find yourself moving around, and it's part of what gets you to kind of, you know, move around the painting itself and be engaged in the painting. You kind of lose a little bit of your subjective self as you look at these, these later paintings. Even in, uh, you know, a more, you know, uh, epic painting like this, the School of Athens, which is once again a one-point perspective, right, where you see, you know, once again the horizon line going through, uh, he has had to adjust these foreground figures once again because of the distortion, <coughs> tilt it up and actually create a second vanishing point down in that group of figures. And part of that is because of where this painting sits. It sits somewhat high. And these are the classic adjustments that have to be made 
just like, uh, let's say, you know, Michelangelo's uh, David, you know, where you have to make these adjustments for where you're seeing that figure from. It happens in the painting, too. I guess what I'm getting at here is that the picture plane is not neutral anymore. The picture plane is being warped or distorted to, to engage you more directly with the painting. If you compare that to the Perugino painting, still very objective, you're, 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 you're looking very mathematically and objective at this. By the time you get to these paintings, <laughs> the painting is messing with you a little bit about where you are and you're, you, know, you start to become uh, you know, more closely engaged between, let's say, the space you're in and the space that the painting is. You, you no longer can kind of separate yourself from that virtual space in the painting. You're kind of more correct, uh, connected to it. That's how it looks to me. Now, I want to show you a contemporary example of that same, uh, let's call it a painter's trick, okay? I mean, listen, this is like magician. You're not meant to tell, but this is what, how it happens, okay? Here is a David Hockney painting, part of the uh, portrait of the artist with two figures, 1972. <laughs> Uh, if we say, well, okay, there's a panorama, that, panorama there and there's a perspective, let's look at the perspective. Well, if I follow this figure's hands, I travel out to a vanishing point here on a horizon line here, which is right where it should be, right? In other words, those mountains are higher than the horizon. I can't see the horizon in this painting. But I know this is about where it lies in the, in the, in the distant view. Um, now, is that me? Or no. Is that? Oh, no. Okay. no. Oh, okay. All right, so here's what I want you to see. Look at the pool, okay? The pool has a vanishing point and a horizon line that's way up here. That pool has, just like in the Raphael painting, been tilted up towards you. All right? Can you see that? And, of course, what that tends to do is focus your eye on the subject matter of the painting. <coughs> now, uh, Back in the 80s, I heard uh, David Hockney talk about what were called his joiners. Have you ever heard of those? This is where he would go out, right, with his instamatic camera, and he'd, take a, he'd come back from the photo lab, and he'd try to assemble them. And, uh, you know, this is what they would look like. Now, if, if, you, if you can imagine what happens when you start to break up a perspective, this is it, right? Uh, and you get this almost physical relationship to that view, or let's say this is, this is one of his joiners of, a, I think it's called the Mayflower Hotel on Sunday morning or something like that. When I heard him talk about this, he was getting ready, oh, Brooklyn Bridge, <laughs> right? Notice his feet right here. So, okay, so he, here's his, you know, vanishing point. Shifting, 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 right down to his feet. Where are you? You're walking this simultaneously. You're looking at this warped frame that you're looking through, right? And so you're like right in it, almost like a wide-angle lens. It is a wide-angle lens in, in many ways, but it's been, it's been constructed. It's just fragmented, right? Once again, you're losing your, your objective view of this painting. Uh, he was about to do this large commission for the Grand Canyon, so he spent a lot of time going right up to the edge of the Grand Canyon with his Instamatic, taking these pictures and trying to then assemble it. Now, what's interesting, late in life, like 2012, he's painting these paintings of the landscape in Yorkshire. Uh, they're not perspectives at all. Right? You're just like, bang, right out there in space, floating in space. You're above these trees, you know, the winding road. But, you know, it's a, like a funhouse view of the landscape. Fabulous, right? There's a little bit of spumat, though, going on, and there's a horizon. But, you know, this is, I mean, this is, this is, uh, 
it's, it's not a perspective-based painting, even though it's a panorama. You know, perspective is not the underlying structure of the painting. Okay, now, this is, this, this is where, this is where I have to be careful. This is where Jenny tells me I get a little off, off the, off the track. But, it's what I think about when I look at these. I mean, there's the frame of the painting, right? That, that separates you from the space you're in, from the virtual space of the painting. <coughs> and in particular, where it's their use of landscape, you know, it's a window, right? And certainly in the 16th century, the idea of the window and the landscape beyond is a prevalent idea, right? The window is what kind of captures that landscape, tames it in a way, keeps it separate from you. It's sort of an objective world while you're in this, you know, kind of interior. Well, you jump ahead to Matisse's paintings in Nice, okay? And the difference between what's outside down here on the beach and what's inside is completely erased. It's irrelevant, right? They're both one and the same. There's still a bit of sfumato to it, right? The colors inside are brighter than the colors outside. And, and, and by the way, I should say, what happens is that as time goes by, we're all more sophisticated viewers. We can't look at, at, at Raphael's paintings the way people did in the 16th century. We're looking at them with this very sophisticated view. So we totally get, we totally understand this. And even in 1918, when Matisse is doing those, we sort of get them. And notice, by the way, the carpet. Is it in a pers perspective gradient? No, it's totally flat. Bang, right on that. It doesn't even matter, right? You, the whole painting is kind of collapsing as you're looking at it. It's no longer that space that's out uh, apart from you. By 1940, I mean, look at it. Look at, for example, this vase. This vase is just like an elevational, you know, cutout. The floor is tilted down, her slippers are down there, peeking out over the top of the carpet, right? You can't tell what any of that space is. This become, it's completely flattened. So, you know, what is now the relationship between the space you're in and the space of that painting? It's not that measured mathematical space of perspective. This is a scene from Godard's uh, Contempt in probably my favorite building, which is the Villa Mall of Marte and Capri. But anyway, here he is. He's looking out that window. He doesn't see the edge of that window frame. There, it's not a window anymore. The window has been eliminated, right? It's a direct relationship between you and the landscape outside. Probably the single most significant contribution of modern architecture was the elimination of the window. In other words, you don't have windows in modern architecture anymore. This is a house by today, Ondo. You just remove the end wall, right? Or say, in the German pavilion at Barcelona by Mies van der you have, you know, there's the curtain wall, the window wall. These are the terms of modern art. You don't have windows. You, it's, it's one or the other. And of course, a big part of that was a different relationship to the landscape. What you wanted in a modern house was to bring the landscape directly in, not through a window, but just bring it directly in. So, this is the way I look at it, which, you know. Here's, this, here's the perspective condition once again. This is, say, Dürer's, um, you know, uh, intersection of these optical lines to a specific point that intersect a picture plane, which is where the perspective is created. And here you are looking through that, that picture frame at that perspective. What I would say is that by the time you get to the 50s and you start looking at abstract expressionism, 
that frame has been removed. And so instead of you as a subject looking at an object on the other side, the object is now just the subject. It's just the same thing. So if you look at Clifford Still, right, there's no perspective. There's no separation. You're the subject. And then the question is, well, what happens at the edge of the painting? This is, this is what painters are struggling with. What, you can't go forever. What's happening? And I, I would suggest that the edge of the painting now becomes sort of the edge of your subjective consciousness, right? I mean, here, here, ooh, you can't even, can you even see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know, that's Agnes Martin. I just, I just love Agnes Martin. Mm -hmm. Right? They're just living in. And what is that, you know, that the palest blue shade out there, right at the edge, you know? Uh, or, you know, Rothko. Or my favorite, Robert Ryman. You know, what happens out there at the edge? Now, <clears throat> I was supposed to talk about the relationship between architecture and painting. Um, I could talk about, let's say, Zaha Hadid's, uh, you know, Russian constructivist aerial paintings and what it means for her work. Um, cover what happens contemporaneously in architecture while this is happening in painting. I always found if you're looking at both, you can, you can understand each one better. But it, it's, it's kind of a vast subject, so a topic for another day. Oh, yes, a question. Oh, goody. <laughs> because you're standing in front of your two paintings, oh, yeah. can you talk about perspective and uh, how you deal with it in those paintings? Oh, well, you're too kind. Um, just the way I wanted you to ask that question. No. Um, I'll tell you, uh, I started out as a plein air painter. If anybody saw my paintings here a few years ago, there are you know, little scenes out there. And um, what happened is after a while, I'd go out into the field. You're going to be able to appreciate this. I would go out into the field to do a painting, and I'd come back with a picture. So I, eventually, I, I, I just went into the studio and tried to paint from memory and move towards abstract. Uh, you know, if I look at a Clifford Still painting or a Rothko painting, I mean, I'm overwhelmed by it. Uh, but it scares me as a painter. It's, right? It's scary, isn't it? I feel like I'm looking a little bit into an abyss, you know? And I think, if I, if I go in that direction, there's, there's no coming back. So, um, what I try to do in my painting is I try to capture the light and dark conditions out there. I still, I still want it to be about nature. I still want it to be about something uh, and about a place. Jenny and I are about to get into uh, an airstream and travel around the country. And so, you know, while she's out there looking at wild horses, I'm going to be like trying to do these, <coughs> these paintings that capture the light and, and darkness of a place. But. Uh, uh, I, I won't have dropped completely into that subjective world of, you know, as much as I admire those. I wonder if that moment actually came and went, you know, the moment of abstract expressionism, but oh my goodness. I mean, I, 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 you know what it's like, you get in front of a huge Rothko painting, and you can weep in front of that, but they're so emotional. Uh, scary things. I, I probably doesn't answer your question at all, but... No. No. Okay. But then I have another question. Oh, all right. Just because I know you, too. Yeah. And I think it hasn't really been explained that you are an architect by training and have been an architect for many years. Oh, yeah. You've lectured at MIT and Harvard on most yeah. of the architecture. Oh, yeah. And, and the transition, what have you found helps you as an architect and what hinders well, you as an architect? Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you two things about it. When I used to teach, this is what I would talk about. I was just talking about painting, um, in relation to architecture. And, and I found it was very helpful to young architects, because they could, they could see, you know, forms of criticism, like, like say, music, has a very precise uh, language for criticism. You know, rubato, allegro non troppo, right? Painting has a 
pretty good language. Architecture is terrible. So I would find talking about painting would be helpful for, for young architects to understand you know, how citing a building in so many, you know, the whole, architects are about placemaking. Well, placemaking is about, you know, the relationship between the space you're in and the space that you're around, you know. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is, that, you know, I started out, I was interested in, you know, urban design, and then I thought, well, I think I'm just interested in architecture. And then, then I got interested in interiors, and then I, then I found, you know, what really gives me a thrill is picking out the fabric for a pillow. And then I realized, no, 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 I'm just a painter, right? So it has been this kind of, you know, I, I don't know what comes after that. So, you know, that, that's the way it is. Yeah, okay. No, right, 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 right. Yes? Um, I'm intrigued by um, the idea of the window in Renaissance paintings. Mm. Is there a pattern of thought behind it, or are they trying to, like, separate the corporal world from heaven, or well, I think I think I think there's a lot of that. Certainly, you know, there's the idea of geometry and the relationship between, you know, human God, uh, humankind, and, and God, etc. Uh, but I also think, you know, the, the the window, particularly in a well constructed perspective, the, you know, it is a window, right? A painting is a window into a scene. And I think that's where, you know, I guess what I was trying to show is they're making these whole huge leaps, sorry, century to century. Uh, that, you know, how that window operates in terms of the relationship between, what did you call it, the corporeal space you're in and the virtual space changes, right? Till it finally, you like to our own sensibility, it's unnecessary, it just is removed, right? So now you're, instead of looking at something objectively, you're looking at it completely subjectively. So the window is no longer necessary. There is no window. You know what I mean? I think that's, that, that's the way I look at it. Yes? I was struck when I was looking at the Raphael painting and the one before. How? Your illusion of space is determined not, not just by perspective, but also by the size of the Figures. people in yes. the background. Did, did yes. they work that out with sort of a formula, or a, you know, just a ratio, or or, or was it just visual? Uh, no, it was very mathematical. Yeah. Um, very mathematical, and um, you know, um, let me see if I can go back like this. And was it something that, I mean, who, who started doing that? Well, once again, I think, I think as they began to realize if you could fix the focal point, you could in fact measure. Right. This is where the survey comes it's like in. Geometry. It's geometry. It's right. geometry. Right? And this is where the survey comes, comes in. So let's see if I can get back to... Uh, what am I, am I going the wrong way? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, we're going the right way. I was, yeah. Is flashback? No, it's interesting to go. Uh, uh, whoops, come on. Uh, let's go. Getting close. Okay, so let's say in, 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 in uh, Raphael's painting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. See? Small figure, right. larger, larger. Right. Um, and once again, because you're up above, if in fact this was taken at eye level, everybody's head would be at the horizon line. That's true. It, right. Exactly. exactly. So in this case, that's what's curious about this, is you're actually in a bird's eye view. Yeah. But yes, absolutely. And that's where, you know, going back to, you know, 15th century architecture, you know, Palazzo Rucci and Alberti, you know, the idea of these floating windows, or even if you're in a, it's all seen perspectively, right? Things that are smaller, you start to assume, if they're in the same proportion as something in the front, 
and something smaller is set in, your assumption is that it's farther away in that virtual space. Right? Because that's how you see it. Right? Just how you see it. Doesn't that sort of have to be learned? Um, you mean as a painter or as just somebody looking at it? As a person. Well, you know, I think, yeah, probably. Yeah, and, and no, so yeah probably. culturally, too. Absolutely. Like yeah. if you look at, say, Indian or oh, Persian yeah. miniatures, the, the people are, they're going up. Yeah. To get further away, but they're not really getting smaller significantly. It's right? totally a Western point of view, and and I think you're right. I think it's it's a it's, it's a culture. But I think that's how we well anyone in this room. This is how we see, right? I mean, there are people out there who can't tell the difference between a painting and something else. But I mean, for people who like to look at paintings, yeah, you're totally you're already looking at everything like it's perspective. I think most of the time. But I, I guess you, I, I think you do learn it. I think you learn it to the point where then when it's not there, <clears throat> there's an amazing quote. Uh, I, if you get the New Yorker a couple weeks ago, uh, Adam Gopnik wrote a uh, piece on Helen Frankenthaler that was just phenomenal. And I don't think, I, I'm gonna misquote this, but one of the things he said is that the, the abstract expressionists didn't think there was anything inherently wrong with perspective. Uh, or the narrative, or the figure, or storytelling. They just wanted to see what would happen if you eliminated it. And what was left, right? And I think that's so interesting. And I think that's exactly right. Because at that point, we're going to still look at it that way. So when you remove it now, uh, you're going to see something different than had you never learned to see in perspective. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well I mean, when I look at Agnes Martin, I see landscape. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and also Joni Mitchell. Yeah, absolutely. Or frankly, if you, if you uh, Richard Ebencorn, <coughs> you look oh, at yeah. the, oh my goodness, they're totally <laughs> flat like quilts, and yet, oh my goodness, it's a deep landscape. And that's where I think, you know, that the picture plane is not neutral. You know, it's 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 it, it, it's not new. It's not it's not just a window anymore. Did you see? There was a show of a few, let's say three or four years ago in Baltimore, Baltimore <laughs> and it was Devin Corn and Matisse. Oh, God. it was oh, unbelievable. That was incredible. Unbelievable. Yeah. And it was big. Yeah, a lot of stuff. It was really <laughs> interesting. Wow. Must have been phenomenal. It was, and it was a lot of what you're talking about yeah. going on there. Which, as you walk through, it was quite a few rooms, four or yeah. five rooms. It yeah. was fabulous. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Big, big, apparently flat paintings. That in fact, yeah. Exactly. I found like with Matisse, you know, when I was growing up, and you first you first encounter those Matisse drawings from Nice, you you think, oh, this is just like a. Uh, you know, a pretty pattern. Yeah, cool. Oh no, actually, I'm looking right. Yeah. It takes a second to see it, uh, yeah. see the depth in it. And D I find Deepin Corin's paintings are like that. Yeah, too. exactly. That must have been phenomenal. Unbelievable. Yeah. Two of my very favorite artists together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'd love show. to have seen that. <laughs> Weren't there a couple of Renaissance architects who faked the perspective? Who Absolutely. Blow out or yeah. paper. Absolutely, like you know, and frankly, at Versailles, you know, the Black Garden tilts in its perspective of this. What's the theater in? Uh, is it in Verona? You know, that has uh, it's a little Shakespearean theater. It has those little perspective uh, alleys, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and that's why I say Aldo Brandini in the end, where they do the opposite, they tilt it the other way. So now it's not a deep. It's suddenly it's very shallow, right? They're very sophisticated about it. Well, anyway, thank you for all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.